It is May 14th in beautiful Los Angeles, California, where it's raining, thank God. We're about to hear some personal commitment speeches today, first from Ann I. East, who's standing before you managing attention, communicating respect non-verbally, finding friendly eyes near the front and the center, say your name, feel the love, start your speech. Hi guys, I'm Anise. Hi Ann Anise. According to a study done by the American Institute of Stress, one out of every five Americans experiences extreme stress. Now, as college students, we are very familiar with the word stress and everything that comes along with it. We're often even commended for our ability to handle our stress. Today, I want to tell you about my personal commitment to manage my stress level. I'm going to tell you about two reasons why I have this personal commitment and three actions that I've taken towards managing my stress. Now, I know you'll all enjoy hearing about all about this because as I said, we're all college students and everybody on this earth experiences stress at some point in their life on some level. So it's good that we all know how we can manage our own stress. Now, the first reason that I choose to manage my stress level is because of last quarter. Last quarter was very, very difficult for me. The excitement of being a freshman in college had kind of worn off and homesickness had sunk in. I took classes which I was not passionate about and I found very difficult, so I didn't do as well in school as I was used to doing, and that made me even more stressed out and anxious. It got to the point where I was so constantly stressed all the time, everything stressed me out, whether it was arguing with my roommate to take out the trash or the next homework assignment I had to do. I didn't realize how stressed I was until the first time I went home last quarter, and my mom took me aside, said that I looked completely different, not as happy as I usually did, and told me that I needed to make sure that I could handle the stress that I was under. Now, the second reason that I choose to manage my stress is because I'm very aware mental illness runs in my family. It's something that's been very prevalent, and anxiety and stress is something my family's had to deal with. When I was six years old, I saw my aunt have a severe anxiety attack and pass out. After I saw this, I was terrified. I knew I didn't want to have that kind of loss of control, and I needed to make sure I could manage my stress. Now, I've also taken three actions in managing my stress level. The first is that every Tuesday and Thursday, I go to yoga to not only relax my mind, but also meditate and learn breathing techniques. Second action that I take is every morning I wake up and I either read a passage from the Bible or an uplifting quote in order to make sure that I start my day off in a positive, happy way. And the third action that I have taken is that I go to Wooden and work out three days a week. I learned in one of my classes actually last quarter, which was neuroscience, that endorphins help, that are released in the brain help you to relieve stress. Now, after I take these actions, I feel so much more calm and comforted and knowing that I can handle stress, even though it's a part of our everyday lives, and I can enjoy the rest of the quarters I have here at UCLA. Now, in summary, I've told you about my personal commitment to manage my stress. I've told you about my two reasons why I've had this personal commitment and the three actions I have taken toward my personal commitment of reducing my stress. I've decided no matter how intense or difficult life gets, I will not let my stress get to me and I'll make sure I can manage it. In conclusion, there should be no doubt in this room that I am personally committed to managing my stress level. So, I will be one of the five Americans that experience extreme stress. And hopefully you guys will find the tools and manage your stress so you won't be either. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start over here today. What was the time? The time was at 3.36. 3.36. Wow. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Gio. Hi, Gio. Hi, Gio. Hi, guys. Um, I thought your speech was very, even though it was short, um, it felt long just because you spoke very uh, slow and clearly, but not slow enough to uh, like keep me out of focus. Um, not like the way your speech felt. I think that uh, it was a very relatable topic, which is good. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gio. You're here. Improvement. Uh, hi, Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, I 
I like the way you talk. You seem very personable. Um, one improvement would be like you seem to like be reading off the script very closely. So like maybe don't be afraid to like maybe tell maybe expand more on your stories and whatnot. Yes. Um, I think um, we'll start with that. Um, 336 is light. And when you were practicing and timing it, what kind of time were you coming in at? I got five minutes. About five minutes. So, interesting. So, you kind of moved through this. Well, let's look at this speech and see where we uh, could, you know, you know, fatten it up, shall we say. You started with an arresting statistic, one in five, and uh, related it to college students. So I thought that was pretty good. I thought you grabbed the interest pretty well. Uh, you made it personal. You were talking about your own stress level, and you were able to relate it with your significant statement to the audience. Now, your first reason... <coughs> Uh, you talked about being homesick, and uh, you talked about not doing well in your classes and fighting with your roommate. Here's where I thought you could have really expanded and given us more personal details and uh, gotten a little more personal. What I would say, and it's something that I said uh, last meeting in class, is and it applies to everybody. We need to get out of the idea that our self-worth is dependent upon the grade we get. I mean, that's just silly. And, uh, but, you know, a lot of us believe it. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, we need to get out of that or we're headed for a lot of uh, heartache and downfall. So I would have expanded that section a little bit. On your... Second reason, uh, you talk about uh, mental illness being prevalent in your family, and you talked about your aunt having an uh, uh, anxiety attack. I, that, there was a story there. We were at Bullock's, and uh, gosh, you know, all of a sudden she fell down and started screaming and yelling, and, blah, 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 and they had to call the paramedics and make. Tell us a story about your aunt's anxiety attack, right? So make it into a story and then with a moral to it. Your actions were <coughs> excellent. Um, yoga and meditation, as you've heard me say to others, I've heard people say that yoga and transcendental meditation or mindful meditation has been very helpful to many students. It's been reported to me to, to manage as a great way to manage stress. Um, the affirmations, reading uplifting literature is just good stuff, so that's good. And then exercise, of course, you know, the endorphins and so forth, so that was good. And you didn't skip the fourth step of saying, and I feel good when I take these actions, so you did that well. Um, again, when you saw that you had so much time from your timer, you could have even expanded there. Um, what happens when you're given a time amount from a boss or somebody, you're given five minutes to make a presentation and you use three? It hurts your credibility a little. It seems like you, don't, you, don't, you didn't prepare enough or you don't have enough to say, so you want to just be within the, the four to five kind of range, you know, whatever time you're given. Your summary, your conclusion, and tie back were all good. Let's look at your canais. Don't forget the fourth part, which you didn't. Use my hand movements purposefully and stay within the time limit. How'd it go? Pretty good. I need to work, I guess... So, I have, like, a question to you is, like, because when I timed it myself, it was usually around five minutes, and I was, like, yeah. always, like, okay, i got to stay below that. But, like, is it because I talk quicker, you think? Or, like, how can I, because when I wrote it out and I did it and practiced it, like, a couple yeah. of times before the year. five minutes. Right. So then I'm, like, should I expand more on the stories and be a little over five minutes when I practice because then it will cut down? I think what you want to do is I want, you want to have spots where you want to be. I think you want to okay. be at three minutes in your second story and that kind of thing. And, and if you have to, you can do your summary conclusion and tie back really quickly. You can just say, summary, I've told you, you know, two reasons, 
three actions that I want to remove my stress. No reason this room. I want to remove my stress and blah blah blah. One in five, and you do that in thirty seconds. Okay. So overall, you did a nice job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that'll bring us to Ho Young Chion, or known as Charlie. <laughs> Hi, Charlie. Does everyone Hi. sign the roll sheet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me see what I can do with this. With this, um, let me see if I can get a better bead on you there. Okay, let's see. A little bit of that way, please. Yeah. How is everyone's morning? He's managing a tent. <laughs> He's got a computer open, communicating respect non-verbally. Finding friendly eyes in the middle, front and the center. Relax your hands. Don't clutch your arms that way. Say your name. Feel the love. Take one half step back if you could, please. Yeah. Say your name. Feel the love. Start your speech. Hi, my name is Charlie. Hi, Hi. Charlie. When I hear someone who isn't a vegetarian say that they prefer <laughs> salads to a burger, I know I'm not supposed to think this, but I think to myself, okay, either you're lying to me or you're lying to your own brain about what your body wants evolutionarily. Because we love French fries and we love sugary foods because our body produce, produ uh, rewards us with these neurotransmitters that make us feel good when we eat them. But in the modern world, when we actually don't have to hunt for a long time to eat a decent meal, it, we have this overabundance of food and it creates this unhealthy excess. And that's why I want to share with you today my personal commitment to improving my, e <clears throat> to improving my eating habits. I will share with you two reasons and three, <coughs> excuse me, three, sto uh, three actions I've taken to demonstrate my personal commitment to eating better. And this matters because we've all had those struggles. Unless you're one of those people with a crazy good metabolism who can eat anything and still be fit. Which, by the way, I want to state for the record, that will not last. <laughs> you will join the rest of society one day. <laughs> but. For the rest of us, we, we have these thoughts, all of us, of what if I ate better? Maybe if I ate better, I'll be less tired. And so one of the reasons why I chose this as my personal commitment is because, to be honest, it's a, it's a vanity reason. I, wanna, I want to look good, especially for the upcoming undie run. And, <laughs> and as you know, the undie run is, is, a, is an event that students do to de-stress. From, uh, from finals by running, in their running around the campus in, the, in their underwear. And my friends always used to tell me, Charlie, you should come, like, it'll be fun, it's gonna be a good time, but I've always felt too self-conscious to go. And I think it comes from this childhood place of, uh, I used to be ridiculed a lot because I was the only overweight kid in my class for like, two grades. And it brought this insecurity in me and I thought maybe if I started eating healthier, maybe it'll, I'll get more confident to run in my underwear. <laughs> and the second reason is much less vain, and it's because I, do, I don't want to get diabetes. My family has a predisposition to diabetes, and actually, my grandpa got diabetes very early on, his, early on and it was really devastating. He, it progressed worse and worse, eventually he had to amputate his legs, and he died from diabetes. And my mom always used to tell me, you have to cut down on your sugary foods, you have to cut down on your fast foods, because you might get diabetes, and that always used to plague my mind. So one action I've taken to, one action I've taken to uh, achieve this personal commitment is avoid fast food chains. And because Ackerman is filled with fast food chains, I don't even go into the building anymore. Yes. When, there, when there's a textbook that I have to buy that's only sold in Ackerman, I'm like, 
all right, I guess I'm not taking that class then. <laughs> but, and so, but if I, I found that if, if I get rid, if I distance myself from my temptation, then I won't be put in that bad spot where I'll be coaxed into making bad decisions. If I'm not an Ackerman, I can't go like, oh, I just ate, but I have this Taco Bell promo code, so like, I guess I know what I'm gonna do. So, but the, and the second thing that I've done to uh, achieve my personal commitment is eat fruit. Normally, I don't like to eat fruits, and people find that surprising because a lot of people like fruits, and they ask me, Charlie, why don't you like fruits? They taste like candy. To which I reply, um, what kind of candy have you been eating? <laughs> But regardless, I've been, I've been working hard to introduce candy into my diet and uh, not and introduce fruit into my diet. Forty <laughs> and slip. Um, introduce fruit in my, into my diet. In the dining halls, I try to eat tropical diet, uh, tropical fruits because they have a lot of vitamin C. Third thing I've been trying to do is to change my attitude because attitude uh, can be your biggest factor in. Uh, biggest leg up or barrier in achieving your goal. So I found that some mental exercises help in me eating better. For example, I started, I changed the word yum to ew and ew to yum. Like, oh ew, Belgian waffle with chocolate shaving and yum, cabbage soup. <laughs> and I found that, okay, I didn't actually love cabbage soup when I did this, but these mental exercising and this priming made me not mind cabbage soup as much. And doing these actions, it felt great. It felt like I was, I was achieving something by co taking control of what, what I'm putting into my body. It felt like I was taking control of my life. It's the same feeling you get after you do great on the midterm. When you get your, when you get your score back, and it's, it's a good one, then all those nights you've put into it don't seem to be that, all those hard nights of those grueling, torturous nights you've put into it don't seem to be that bad anymore. So, in summary, I have told you uh, why, uh, I have told you why the two reasons and three actions I've done to personally commit to eating better. I wanted to eat better and eat healthier because I want to look good and I want to avoid getting diabetes. And in order to do so, I've <coughs> in order to do so, I've uh, eaten fruits. I have avoided fast food chains, and I have changed my attitude. There should be no doubt in this room that I am personally committed to eating better. We we as human we as human beings are products of millions and millions of years of evolution this beautiful chain of life rolling and rolling forward and we in general prefer burgers to salads for the same reason that we uh, we cringe when we see photos of spiders and snakes but not photos of guns even though the latter actually is a bigger threat to us in modern life because evolution has not prepared us for modern life that's why it's it takes much more effort to, that's, that's why we have to override our instincts, and that's why it takes a lot of effort to eat healthier. But in the end, it's worth it, because not, um, not, if not for your vanity reasons, then for your health and well-being. Thank you. Good time. 640. 640. Okay, where are we? We're over here somewhere. There, yeah. Hi, Gabe. Um, I really like your uh, your speech. Uh, I actually started dieting last year, and it does suck a lot, but it does get a lot better. Um, and I really connected. I thought you uh, opened up with us and told us about why you're self-conscious and all that. And uh, yeah, keep at it; it gets easier. Thank you. Thank you, Gabe. Improvement. Hi, I'm Becky. Hi, Becky. Hi, Becky. So I really enjoyed how you made everything really funny, but then I think there are points where like, the jokes kind of um, took away from the seriousness of some of the things you were trying to say, because I had to like, take like, a few seconds to process what you were saying, like, oh, that was really funny. What's he talking about now? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right, he walked over his serious points because he walked on his last lines. Good point. Well, Charlie, uh, let's talk about your speech. Um, did you time it and check it before? Yes, but initially it was uh, 
Initially it was like 10 minutes, but then I kind of trimmed the fat. Trimmed it down. Trimmed trim the fat, huh? Yeah. Okay. No pun intended. I think, um, let's, let's start with this intro. Um, I think uh, you said uh, people prefer shallows of birds or lying, and then you gave us this thing about neurotransmitters and evolution. It was a little bit wordy and long and didn't really grab me. I think you could have come up with something a little bit better, and you could have picked up some time there. Your thesis of better eating habits, better eating habits, and uh, your preview was fine, excellent. Your uh, sig statement of sharing with the audience and your use of humor there was good. You have a good sense of humor. Don't lose that. Uh, it's a good quality to have. Not everyone has that. And so that's, that's a good thing. On your uh, first reason where you, where you were honest and you said, you know, mm, it's vanity, you know, it was very personal. I, w I want to look good for the undie run. And uh, <clears throat> so that was interesting. Uh, what I wish you would have elaborated on was when you were tubby, or as you put it, chubby, yeah, when you were younger and the humiliation of that and maybe how kids made fun of you. And you said you were the butt of a lot of jokes yeah. and that sort of thing. And relive and feel that humiliation and share that with us. And so we feel the, the, the pain of that. We know that that would have been a good story there. I would have spent a little more time on that. On your second reason, diabetes, your grandfather uh, lost his leg and your mother warning you was compelling reasons and I believed you and it was personal. On your actions, um, you could have just left it. This is where it got long and wordy and this is where I think you could have picked it up. You could have just said, I avoid fast food. We didn't need to say Ackerman Grand Ballroom, I avoid, I don't go to Ackerman, the Taco Bell, blah, 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 blah. all wordiness stuff that could have been left out. It was kind of cute and funny, but you lost time there, see? On your second point of eating fruit, you could have just said, I eat fruit, mostly tropical fruit. <laughs> End of it. Third, um, you're changing your attitude. You, 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 you went into quite an explanation of how that worked with cabbage soup. It was kind of interesting, but that took a long time. When you watch yourself tonight on YouTube, you'll see that it, it took a while to, to explain all that. You did an excellent job of saying how you feel about the actions, and so you brought your audience back with your feelings. Your summary uh, was too long. You, you got into too much detail when you saw you were going so over. Your conclusion was fine. And your tie back again went into this evolutionary, complicated, scientific explanation of why we haven't adapted and we crave. And I don't think it was a real killer kind of ending that oh, we reached closure on. So um, it was too complicated. We want to have a simple, more uh, simplified okay. beginning and ending. But overall, Charlie, you got the job done. Thank you. Okay, that'll bring us to... Rachel. Hi, Rachel. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Great. Am I good here? Um, yeah. You can even come a step forward. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, she stands before you managing attention, communicating respect non-verbally, finding friendly eyes near the front of the center. Say thank you, little love. Start your speech. Hi, Rachel. Hi. 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 Hi
Hi, my name is Rachel. Hi, Rachel. I am incredibly blessed to be the oldest of four kids. I have two younger brothers and a younger sister, and I love them so much. And I remember when my youngest brother was born, I was uh, in the hospital with my mom, and it was just the two of us. I don't know where the rest of my family was. And uh, we were talking about how excited we were about the new baby, and I was so excited to have a new little brother. And she told me, she was like, you know, as the oldest sister, you have uh, a really special role. You get to be... Um, an influence on your younger siblings, you get to be a role model for them, and it's really going to be important as they grow up to be that role model for them and be there for them. And that's always kind of stuck with me, and I think going to college, I lost a little bit of that going into my first quarter. I think um, coming to college, everything was so new, I was so focused on school and sports, and I wasn't in contact with my siblings as much as I wanted to be. So today I would like to share with you my personal commitment to be a more supportive older sister. I have two reasons um, and three actions I've taken um, to be more supportive to my younger siblings. And I think you're all going to um, enjoy hearing about this and relate to this because I think as college students, we've all left either siblings or parents or friends at home, and we've all kind of had to figure out how to balance um, making new friends at school and also staying in contact with the people from back home. So my first reason as to why I want to be a more supportive older sister is that my siblings have always supported me um, in everything that I've done, and that's meant a lot to me, and I really want to return that support. I remember last year I was at a swim meet, and I wasn't sure if my parents were going to be able to come or my siblings were going to be able to come, and they weren't there at the beginning, but right before my race I looked up into the stands, and they were all there with their brew and attire, and um, they were cheering for me, and it just made me feel so happy and supported that they were there because I knew they had a lot of other things going on in their own lives. And it was just special, and I felt like um, they genuinely were interested in what I was doing, and that made me feel really good. And I wanted to make sure that I was returning that support to them uh, for what they were interested in. The second reason I would like to be a more supportive older sister is that I feel like coming to college, I lost contact with my siblings. It wasn't that I didn't talk to them as much, but um, I just didn't talk to them as much as I would have liked. And uh, the first night I came home from fall quarter freshman year, um, for Christmas break, my sibling, my youngest brother, Lucas, really wanted to play a board game as a family. He really wanted to have family time. So we played a board game. It was great, and um, it was really fun, and went to bed. And the next morning, I woke up, and I was in the kitchen eating breakfast, and I was talking with my mom, and she was like, do you realize how much your siblings miss you? And I said, well, yeah, I mean, they miss, they miss me, and you know, I miss them too. And she's like, I don't think you do. She's like, Lucas came down this morning, came down the stairs, and was talking to me, and said he had so much fun last night playing a board game with you and he misses you so much. And when he said that, two tears dripped down his cheek. And I, um, in that moment, I was shocked because I didn't realize how much um, that it meant for me to be home for them and also that I ha realized I hadn't stayed in contact with them and I hadn't really been there as much as I could have. So now I'd like to share three actions that I've taken to be more supportive to my siblings. Um, first of all, I called home more, and I called a lot in the fall, but oftentimes I would just talk to my parents because I would call them during the day and my siblings were in school. So I really made the effort to try to call during different times so that I can talk to each of my siblings individually um, at least two times during the week. Um, and I've also done more Skype, and so that's really helped, and I feel like I just feel more connected with them in their lives. The second thing I've done to be a more supportive sister is that um, I not only just, you know, just ask them about their day, but I make sure I know what going on in their lives. I asked my brother how his baseball game went and asked my sister like what her dress looks like for the new dance. So I try to stay in touch with what the activities and what's going on in their own lives. And then the last thing I've done to be a more supportive sister is that I, when I do come home, I make sure that I really set aside that family time and that I spend time with each of them individually because I didn't realize how much that meant to them. And uh, when I played that board game as a family, um, I realized how much it meant to my brother, and I want to make sure that I can return that. And then when I perform these actions, I really just feel so thankful that I have um, such a great relationship with my siblings, and it also just makes me happy that I can be there for them and support them in what they're interested in. So in summary, I've shared uh, two reasons as to why I want to be a more supportive older sister, and three actions I've taken to be a more supportive older sister. So, in conclusion, uh, there should be no doubt in this room that I am personally committed to being a more supportive older sister than my siblings. And I hope that wherever I go, whether I stay in L.A. after college or move to a different state or go back home, that I always try to maintain that contact um, and support for them 
because I've really come to understand through coming to UCLA how much it means to them to be there for them. So, thank you. Thank you. Time? 4.57. Okay, thank you. We're uh, here. Hi guys, I'm Silvio. Silvio. I really related Hi, to your Silvio. speech because I'm also the oldest. And so I, it was like really moving and I, it was really relatable. And I really liked how you were very organized and really approachable in your speech. You came off as like very like relatable, I guess. Thank you. Likeable speaker. Yeah. Improvement. Hi guys, I'm Anise. Hi, Hi Anise. Rachel, I really, really loved your speech. I thought it was Thank overall you. great. I, if I had to pick one thing, I would say just don't use the word so as often, but you barely even used it. But besides, that, it was great. Thank you. Rachel, let's talk about your speech. You started with, I guess, a personal observation or story of your little sister, was it, or brother? Better brother being born and your mother saying aha you're a role model so there was kind of this you know hospital bed talk and it was kind of an interesting uh, story that um, grabbed us and drew us in and got our attention your thesis was clear you wanted to be a, a more supportive sister to your siblings and your preview was good. Your SIG statement was good. Uh, I think that uh, you sold it, you used the phrase, you will be interested, and so you got their interest going. On your main body, uh, you, um, you said uh, that... Uh, there was this race, you weren't sure if they were going to come, and then they came at the very end, so there was kind of this dramatic thing, you weren't sure if they were going to come, because then they did come, and so you wanted to return the support that they gave to you, so that was your first reason, that was pretty good. Uh, the second reason was a little bit more personal, which is what I was after, it wasn't r super personal, but it was the idea of the Christmas break and your brother with a tear in his eye and you got good emotion going and you got your audience to feel it because you felt it too. And it was a great realization for you that, uh, you know, you were important to your siblings and they missed you and that you, you weren't just off of college, la di da, you know, swimming your life away and, you know, blah, 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 and, you know, to hell with the rest of the world. Um, so that was good, okay? Now, um, on your actions, uh, you said you talked to them on the phone or Skype and uh, at least twice a week. And secondly, you said that you uh, kind of take notes and you ask them about specific things, not just how is your day, but what about that dress and, you know, specific things. And I think that makes a difference because it shows you're really interested and not just blah, 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 you know, you know, walking through the effort of it. So that was good. <clears throat> and then uh, coming home was consistent with your PC. Uh, your actions, uh, you said you feel happy being a better sibling, and so that was a good fourth point and a good feeling thing to reestablish with your audience. Your summary was good, your conclusion was good, and uh, your tie back to your mother's conversation in the hospital was good. You said you wanted to move three times, don't lock your hands, and use more hand motion, how did it go? Um, I moved three times. Yeah. Um, I'm not quite sure. I think I did a little bit less of locking hands, but I think I still need to work on that. Yeah. It's something just like I just do it automatically. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I was trying to do more hand motions because I feel like if I did that, I wouldn't lock as much. So I think I did improvement, but I think there, I can definitely do more improvement on that. So. I don't know, I was distracted by some talking voice coming from somewhere. Um, I'm sorry. Okay, I think you did well on your canais. I would just say 
you stood quite a bit over there. By, can you move that podium because it's ruining yeah. the picture? Can you move it even it's further right. away? Uh, yeah, it's into the corner. Of- yeah, and then yeah, that's better. <laughs> Uh, you spent quite a bit of time over on that side and okay. not, not enough time back in the center. Mm-hmm. But I liked your speech. It was good. It was personal. And you're, you're a likable speaker. So you did a good job. Thank you. Okay, that will bring us to... Silvio. Hi, Silvio. Hi there. How you doing? I'm good. Great. Oh, just a minute. Sounds like my phone is on. Just a minute. No, it's off. Maybe someone else's phone that was talking. Okay. Let's see. You're good. Yeah. He stands before you managing attention, communicating respect non-verbally, finding friendly eyes near the front and the center. Say your name. Feel the love. Start your speech. Right. Hi, guys. I'm Sylvia. Hi, Silvio. I often find myself so busy living in the moment that I forget to kind of reflect on myself and really ask myself important questions. And those questions are, you know, do I really know myself or do I even like myself? And unfortunately, there are times where I don't like myself for one reason or another. It could be something I've done, something I've failed to do, how I think it will perceive me, how I perceive myself. But uh, a quote that really stood out to me was by Buddha, and he said, peace comes from within. Do not seek it without. And that can be interpreted in a lot of ways, but the way I interpret it is that you can't really be the best version of yourself unless you truly accept yourself, regardless of what people think. And that's why I want to share with you today my personal commitment to really liking myself. And I'm going to provide two reasons and three actions that I've done to why to show you how I've done this. So the first reason why I've done this is that I've always cared a lot about what people think of me. And this has really stemmed from my middle school years. So I grew up in a K through eight school, where basically I knew everyone from kindergarten to like eighth grade. But in seventh grade, my parents made me move schools for various reasons. So I went to this new school that was also K through eight, and I was the new kid. And as you guys know, middle schoolers are not really the nicest people out there. So even though I was genuine and social and just being myself, I was still not really fully accepted because I was I had the stigma of the new kid. And I lasted for about a semester, and that semester kind of was like, I, was re- I felt really rejected, really lonely. Uh, I began to raise up my parents. I wasn't really the outgoing, outspoken person I was because I felt like every time I spoke, I would be like, judged or kind of be glared at. So I just kind of you know, felt this pressure on me that I've never really felt before because I've never struggled to fit in. But this is where that insecurity stems from. And it's something that I still deal with today. And when I do uh, feel myself caring about what people think, I get really frustrated with myself because I don't really see the logic behind that. So the second reason uh, that I want, that I'm personally committed to liking myself is that I always put others before myself and I forget to do things for myself sometimes. So in high school I was extremely involved, I was in a lot of extracurriculars and clubs, especially student council. And my freshman year I was in charge of a dance for a the biggest pep rally of the year and this involved costumes and choreography and rehearsals and the, one of the rehearsals happened to fall on my 15th birthday. And in my culture, um, I'm Hispanic, a 15th birthday is a big deal. You know, girls have quinceañeras and guys kind of just spend the birthday with their, with their family because it's just like a big milestone. And so I actually decided to go to the rehearsal instead because I felt that it was more important to get the work done and to make sure everyone else is ready for the pep rally. And I kind of neglected my parents and they took that really personally and my mom cried. And it's something that I was extremely guilty about and that I regret till this day because I can never relive that birthday. No, I can never have that event again. And so it made me realize I always do that and I always put people before myself. And that makes me really frustrated because it's something that I don't intentionally do, it's I unconsciously do. And so that brings me back to the three actions I've done to 
achieve this personal commitment to liking myself more. So the first one is to focus on the positive traits that I have and my successes instead of dwelling on my failures and my flaws. I feel that if I focus on the positive things in life, I will achieve more things because it's kind of this positive energy that I'm surrounding myself with. That also ties into my second action, which is to only surround myself by positive people or positive things. I don't really have, I believe I don't have space in my life for people who are just negative and who are very judgmental. I feel like they don't really contribute anything to your life, so why have them there? And, you know, focus on things that really make you happy. And the third action is to say no more often. To say no to people asking me for favors or even no to invitations to things. To things. Because there, I do need that time to really just focus on myself and to reflect on myself. Uh, to really make myself a happier person. And these three actions have really made me feel less stressed, uh, more relaxed, more uh, secure in myself, and like I said, overall happier. So in summary, I've told you two reasons and three actions I've taken to liking myself uh, more. And there should be no doubt in this room that I am truly personally committed to this cause. If I were to ask myself right now if I like myself, I would say I'm content with who I am. But not 100% happy. Because I feel like there's always room for improvement and for growth as a human being. and the one thing I can say is that I'm optimistic that the person I'll be in the future will be a happier person than the person I was in the past. Thank you. Time. 4.45. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Aaron. Hi, Hi Aaron. Um, Silvio, I like your speech a lot uh, because you, you made it, you, you, you talked about things that we all sort of go through uh, and it made a lot of sense to us. And I think uh, you did a great job of connecting, even though your stuff is very personalized, I think you did a great job of making everyone else feel the same thing. Thank you. Good, yeah. It's very personal, yeah. Good, Hi, everyone. I'm Fabia. Hi, Fabia. Um, I like your speech. I don't really see like a lot of things I could tell you for improvement, but maybe one is uh, have more contact with the audience because you're sometimes really like looking at the ceiling. So. More eye contact, yeah. yeah. And you want the contact to be three to five seconds long. When you walk to the side, work that side of the room, glance over there, make it three to five seconds long. Silvio, let me say the positive first. Very personal. Very uh, opening up really shared lots of your inner thoughts, which is what I was after, so you got the essence of what I was after with your assignment. I felt it was very authentic. I thought you were real, and so I liked that. Your opening, you asked some really big questions. Do I really know who I am? Do I like who I am? And those were uh, big uh, questions. And... Um, you sort of brought the Buddha quote in ahead of your thesis, which was okay. You moved it around a little bit. It worked. You know, it was fine. Um, and you gave us a preview then. So the first reason you told us that you were interested in working on liking yourself was your K-8 experience where you were the new kid and you were terribly lonely and you had the new kid stigma and you were rejected and you resented your parents and so forth and uh, I could feel your loneliness because you were remembering it and feeling it and that's what we call felt sensing and that's how you communicate feelings and so that was uh, good. You had kind of a moral to the story at the end when you said I eventually got through this stage in my life but caring about the opinions of others is still a problem I deal with today. So that was uh, good. The second reason I am PC to liking myself is I always put others before myself and I forget to do things for myself. And you talked about uh, your extracurricular activities of your big 15th birthday and in the Latino culture, that's a big event. And you, instead of spending it with your family, went to a rehearsal. And so we could feel the angst of that and the pain of your parents. And so that was very personal and that was a good story. And, um, you know, uh, it was um, well told. 
Now, on your actions, uh, I like the way you're focusing on the positive, that was good, and surrounding yourself with positivity and learning to say no. Um, and how you feel about that is you're feeling better, and so that was good. Your summary, your conclusion, and tie back were all good. And I like the fact that you didn't sugarcoat this in the end, like saying, okay, I'm now Buddha, I've got my act yeah. together that I sing, that I still have a ways to go. There's, you know, Mark Twain said, you know, people are about as happy as they make up their mind to be, and there's, there's, there's a guy in, in the psych department at, um, down in, down in Friends Hall that studies happiness, and he talks about, you know, this whole idea of just uh, the happiest people are the ones that have just, just a little gap between what they want and what they're getting, and they don't have this big thing, they don't want them. Ten million dollars, you know that sort of thing. So uh, there's a lot written about it, and you can look into that kind of literature. And if you're still struggling with this notion of what's going to make you happy, on your canais, you said I want to use vocal variety, avoid filler words like um, and don't look at the ground or ceiling in searching for the next thought. How'd it go? Um, the filler words, I never can tell if I use them or not until I watch it back because mm -hmm. I feel like it's a subconscious thing. So yes. I practice on that. Uh, what was the second The second one was... Uh, vocal variety. Vocal variety, I think I uh, yeah, was asked monotones before. Yeah. And then the third one, uh, the ceiling, I was trying to... I feel like I made eye contact out with this side of the room because there was a lot of people, but uh -huh. I felt like awkward glaring at Anise. Like, and, like, um, I'm probably like on your name right now, I'm sorry. But, like, kind of staring at people and then, like, and not hardly having one in the back, so I would kind of... Look your way up. Around. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Um... Work on that, that five second, it's, it's pretty long actually to really connect with somebody for three to five seconds, but uh, it really locks your audience in with you and it will be uh, make you more effective. The other thing is when you're practicing with a live person as opposed to a mirror, tell them that one of your goals is to eliminate the filler ums and to ask them to raise their hand every time you use them and then you'll be more aware because you can watch yourself and see it but you're still going to do it unless someone is giving you feedback that you're using um too excessively overall you fulfilled the assignment nicely of giving me a personal commitment thank you thank you Okay, that will bring us to Becky. Hi, Becky. Hello. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. So your goals are on this thing, huh? Oh, oh, there they are. I see him. I see him. I see him. Yes. Okay. Let me. Let me. You can come forward. Come forward. Come forward. Come forward. Come forward. Yeah. Okay, that works. She stands before you. He's on his phone, managing attention, communicating respect non-verbally, saying your audience to yourself, "I respect you." Funny, friendly eyes down the front of the sun, saying your name to the love safety. Hi, I'm Becky. Hi, Hi, Becky. So, John Dewey, a prominent philosopher, psychologist, and educational reformer, once said, Education is not preparation for life. Education is life itself. <laughs> so, today, I want to tell you about my personal commitment to education for both myself and others. So, I will talk about two reasons why I'm committed to education and three actions that I have taken to achieve, well, to demonstrate this personal commitment. And so I think that you will find that you can resonate with the themes of empowerment, change, and hope of how why I'm personally committed to education because you're all in this classroom today in higher education at UCLA. Okay. 
So the first reason that I am personally committed to education, it starts with my grandpa. So my grandpa was raised in rural China and he was a very, very poor farm boy. And during the first war, he, China didn't really have a lot of supplies going around because everyone was really poor and everything. He was on the brink of starvation. And so he, I remember him telling me that while he was on um, the brink of death, um, he had a lot of fortunate circumstances that brought him back. And one of those was being um, educational opportunities from the Chinese government. And so he was able to take this opportunity and create a better life for himself. And eventually he worked hard and he was able to become a college professor because of that. So from going to the brink of starvation to having a family, being a college professor, and influencing lives, I recognize the power of um, education in transforming a life. And if it weren't for education, I might not be standing here today. And so with that, I feel empowered. The second reason that I am personally committed to education is because I believe that change starts with the students of today. And part of this is because I recognize that my time on Earth is actually pretty limited. I'm going to be here, and then I'm not going to be here. And in the words of my friends, we live on through our effects on other people. So I'm really optimistic that the problems that we're facing today with, say, like racism, um, world hunger, war, all of that can be changed and will be changed by students of today, today working for a better future. We can make that change, and I want to make it happen, and the base of that is through education. And for that, I feel hopeful. And now, I've taken three actions that will help me demonstrate this personal commitment to education. And so bear with me because most of these actions are more um, internal and mental versus actual physical actions. And so the first action that I've taken in demonstrating this personal commitment to education is contemplating the opportunities that I do have. Because at UCLA, things can get really stressful, as I'm sure you all know, um, between like balancing extracurricular activities with schoolwork and everything. I sometimes get really stressed and I don't want to study anymore and everything, but then I have brought upon myself lately to think about the opportunities I have, like really contemplated when I'm feeling really stressed out. Like millions of people would kill to be in your place right now. And that makes me think like, oh, I'm really lucky to have this opportunity. And I slow down and really commit myself. The second um, action that I've taken to demonstrate this personal um, commitment is to um, commit myself to earning a PhD and going in back into the field of academia. And so like a lot of you, um, college was a really hard time for me because I really want to explore my passions and everything and reaching that conclusion has been difficult. But once I decided that I really wanted to go into education, I really felt that that was where I belonged. And so I want to follow in the footsteps of my grandparents who still have like students I keep in contact with them today and leave a really um, powerful role in their lives. I want to both teach them um, academic knowledge as well as humanity, still humanity. Which leads me to my third action, is that I want to commit to teaching at a community college when I'm older. Because I realize that not everybody has the same opportunities that we do um, here at UCLA. And I want students to change tomorrow, to realize that they too are powerful, they are cared for, they are smart, and they can change the future for the better. So of all those actions, and here at UCLA, um, I finally found my passion for education, and that has instilled within me a sense of security. I feel secure, and I feel confident that we can bring a positive change for tomorrow. So I've told you two reasons and three actions that I've taken to demonstrate my personal commitment to education. And there should be no doubt in the room, you should hold absolute confidence in my personal commitment to education. I stand before you here today because I am personally committed to my own education at UCLA. And for me, education will never end. I will never stop educating myself. And so in the words of John Dewey, to me, education is life. Thank you. Thank you. Time? 5.15. 5.15. <laughs> <laughs> Cuts it to the bow. <laughs> OK, we're here. Hi, Hi, Sophia. Um, I really liked your speech. I thought you had clear structure and it was easy to follow. You were really 
good communicator, and I could tell that you had rehearsed a lot. And I, I thought it was inspiring, and sometimes I get tired of education and being here, but <laughs> inspired me. So. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of an old topic with a new twist on it. Improvement. Hi, I'm Hazy. Hi, I'm Hazy. Hazy. I really like your speech. I thought it was really inspiring as well, and like it made me think about like what I'm doing with my education. And you were really personal about your personal stories and backgrounds. Improvement. I would say trying to have more eye contact because I noticed that sometimes you would be looking on the ground instead of looking at your audience. So that's. that's yeah. it. That's a good suggestion. Let's start with that, Becky. What, what, what were you thinking about with your eye contact? Were you making three to five seconds around to everybody? Yeah, I think I made like three to five seconds around certain areas, and then I sort of just dropped to the ground again before I like brought it back up and circled again. So. Okay. Yeah, you don't want to uh, do it systematically, but over there, over there. And, and when you walk, you know, kind of... Um, Focus on that side, but glance to the other side. Let's talk about your speech and your personal commitment. You started with John Dewey, and you gave kind of a heavy quote uh, in which you said, education is not preparation for life. Education is life itself. You know, And I would have uh, given a beat or two to let that sink in and let people think about that rather than education is not preparation for life education is life itself John Dewey is a prominent philosophy give people a moment to uh, think about these heavy uh, thoughts so you wanted to share with us your PC to education and you your thesis preview was good and um you uh, related your sixth statement to empowerment, change, and hope. And as Sophia back there said, you know, she was kind of, you know, a little tired of education and her own education, so it kind of brought her back a little bit. So I thought that worked okay. So let's talk about your first reason. You gave a personal story about your grandfather being a poor farm boy and having a tough time of it and yet working his way up to become a college uh, university professor and from that you were were and are inspired to sort of do the same to follow in his footsteps to uh, achieve to to uh, continue to have the same fire in his belly that um, uh, uh, that he had. Um, sometimes, as I think you've heard me say in class, sometimes when parents make it too easy for their children, they they lose that drive their, of wanting to really do something great or achieve something. You know, the the, the tiger in the tank. So it was nice to see that you wanted to you know achieve that. So that was pretty personal and good. Your second reason was changing the future through the students of today. Um, here, this was a little less personal than I would have liked. Um, you, you alluded to the fact that you're going to die soon or sometime or you have a short time on earth. We all do. And uh, so how do we make a lasting impression? How do we... Do we pass on our DNA through our children? Do we pass? Do we do things with our work like Beethoven or Mozart? Or, you know, how do we, you know, achieve uh, immortality? You know, on Earth. And you talk about doing it through works of education. I would have liked a little bit more personal in your second reason. Okay, I don't think you opened up a lot for us about you. I still don't know you. Just to be blunt about it. Okay, on um, your actions. So you contemplate, you meditate, and you think about it, and I think that's good. That's that's a, that's not that's an 
That's not a thing to be ashamed of. That's a good thing to do. I think everybody should meditate twice a day for 20 minutes and they'll uh, have a better life. They'll, they'll think about what they're doing on the merry-go-round all the time. It's good to get off for 20 minutes and think about all the running they're doing. So I think that's good. Your second action of following your grandfather's footsteps was consistent with your PC and then teaching in a community college that seems like good work that's those are students that are uh, you know high school didn't go so well and so they're they, they need a little extra time to get their act together it doesn't mean they're stupid or anything else they just uh, need a little more time to um, get their act together um, so that was, those were all consistent things with uh, your PC. Your summary was fine, uh, your conclusion was okay, and your tie back to John Dewey was good. Your goals were to have volume increase in control, to be louder I guess it was, and to move three times with purpose and to say, sustain eye contact without blinking. How'd it go? Uh, volume, I feel, was, was better, but I, I usually like overestimate myself. Um, yeah. Movement was better than last time, so I was like, oh, yeah. okay. Um, yeah, I made a conscious effort to not blink as much, because when I watched the video, I blinked a lot. Right, yeah. right. So I, th I caught myself sometimes when I was looking too much and I tried to stop myself, so that was probably why I was like looking down for a bit. The blinking breaks the connection a little bit, as I'm sure you know, and so you want, you want to avoid that if you can. But overall, you got the job done. You just needed to be a little bit more personal and open to, for, to be more authentic when you're, when you're speaking so we get to know you when you're expressing your personal commitment. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to Hazy. Hi, Hazy. Oh, your printer's dying, huh? <laughs> okay, she stands before you. He's on his phone. Managing attention, communicating respect. Finding friendly eyes near the front and the center. Say your name. Feel the love. Start your speech. Hi, everyone. I'm Hazy. I'm Hi, Hazy. A famous 19th century Irish poet, a playwright, and author, Oscar Wilde, wrote that loving yourself is the start of a lifelong romance. <laughs> While this might seem easy and pretty self-explanatory, if we think about it, it's loving yourself and accepting who you are is sometimes the hardest thing to do in life because we are the worst critic of ourselves. I have to admit that I, uh, I am always underestimating my cap capabilities and I'm the one who always judges me the most harshly. Today I want to share with you my personal commitment to be more confident and I will tell you two reasons why I want to be personally committed to being more confident about myself and also the three actions that I took to be more confident. So the first reason that I want to be more personally committed to being confident is because my lack of self-confidence led me to suffer from depression in my first year of college. Coming to UCLA as a first year, I, to be honest, UCLA was not my first choice in college, and as a valedictorian of a private competitive high school, I always had higher expectations for myself. I used to be a student who always worked hard to get the things that I wanted, not only in terms of academically, but in other areas as well, and not getting accepted to my first choice college was the first rejection that I had in my life. And coming to think of it right now, it wasn't such a big deal, but at that time, it was made me heartbroken, and I started doubting myself and my worth. Like, am I really good enough? Are there anything that I can do better? And even though I did perfectly fine in my first year in UCLA, that thought of being rejected was always in the back of my head and affected me in every single way. I was never happy. I was 
always comparing myself to others. Oh, she has a better internship, she's doing perfectly well in other areas, am I really good enough? So that's the first reason why I want to be personally committed to being more confident. The second reason I want to be more confident about myself is because my lack of confidence started to influence me in the way I interact with other people. As my depression got worse, it really made it difficult for me to have daily social interactions because every time I meet somebody new, I would be so self-conscious about how they would look at me, how they would judge me, would they really like me as who I am. So I could never truly be myself when I interact with people and always self-consciously think about what I have to do to make myself better, to make myself likable from other people's point of view. And it was just really difficult. So the three actions that I did to be more personally committed is first, I tried to take better care of myself, both physically and psychologically. I started working out every day. I tried to make myself more presentable. And it seems pretty superficial, but I think it is important to take care of yourself physically as well. So that's the first step. And in terms of having a healthier mindset, I started going to CAPS, which is a counseling program. And also, I started talking to my friends and close family about my problems. It was difficult at first, making myself vulnerable and exposing my problems, but I think sometimes it's better if you just let yourself out and talk to other people to get more advice. The second action that I took to be more confident about myself is to do the things that I really love and passionate about. I really like singing, so in the beginning of my second year, I joined the Detroit Acapella group, and I really enjoyed being there and doing something that I truly enjoy. And having the opportunity to perform in front of so many people, it just boosts your confidence and make you feel better about yourself and realize that there are things that I can do really well. The third action that I took is that I recently got into a relationship and I'm trying really hard to I'm practicing really hard to be honest about my feelings and it's really hard and it feels awkward and strange at first but knowing that you will accept me and respect me for who I am it makes it easier every time and I can be more comfortable about expressing what I feel. So in summary I told you oh and doing these actions it made me feel really happy and I'm starting to learn that I am a really important person for who I am and each and every step that I take I'm learning to become a better person. So in summary I told you about the two reasons why I want to be personally committed to being more confident and three actions that I have taken so far to be more confident about myself. There should be no doubt in this room that I am personally committed to being more confident. And as Oscar Wilde said, I'm starting a lifelong romance with myself. And it's hard, but with every step I take, it's becoming better. I'm feeling happier, and I'm feeling more confident about myself. Thank you. <laughs> Time? 521. 521, okay. So close, but so far. Yes, please. Hi, Lizzie. I really like the speech. Start with your name. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Shane. Hi, I'm Shane. I, I really like speech because I can really personally relate to it because I felt like I should boost my confidence too. So uh, I yeah. like your quote in the introduction because I think it grabs my attention. I also like your actions because. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I realized this, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Improvement? I am Lily. Hi, Lily. Hi, Lily. Um, Hazy, I really liked your speech. I thought it was very honest, and I feel that, like, um, we really, like, kind of, like, understood some new things about you. Uh, I think one improvement, um, I noticed sometimes you'll look at the floor, and other times you will like, gaze off into distance. I think that's... That might be just trying to remember things, but I think you can try it. Okay, those are good thoughts. Hazy, um, gosh, um, this was very personal, and uh, you really opened up, and we got to know you better, and so thank you for trusting us and being so honest about yourself. Started with 
Oscar Wilde, and uh, to love oneself is the beginning of a lifelong romance. Um, <laughs> I was chuckling at this quote because I think he meant it in a different way, but I saw how you meant it, and so it was good. Um, and you kind of transitioned to your thesis, which was nice, about how you were so harsh on yourself and that you wanted to be more confident. Um, I believe you skipped over your SIG statement and didn't, didn't sell this enough to the audience. Um, but let's talk about your first uh, reason. You said you were depressed your first year, you were valedictorian. UCLA wasn't even your 10th choice, and here you are, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, uh, you know, and you, even when you were here, you were doubting your, uh, you know, still doubting yourself even though you're here. Uh, real interesting in this uh, great professor that gave this lecture on Tuesday night, my last lecture, he talked about his failures that he sent out 26 resumes and got 26 rejections and had to teach high school math to uh, support his family for a while until he could get back into the university. So, you know, the greatest of them have had setbacks and failures and, you know, you just keep a going and get up and dust yourself off and move on. Um, your second reason, I thought, too, was very personal about your depression and being judged in a vicious cycle and uh, uh, avoiding, you know, being a, being a social hermit and avoiding people was very, uh, very personal to share with us. Um, the actions that you've taken... I thought were solid and good. Uh, uh, the affirmation that you're doing, getting counseling, that took some courage to tell us about that. That was really excellent. Um, you're joining the uh, a cappella group and singing the. Uh, you didn't mention your solo, but in front of you know two thousand people. Again, that boasts your confidence, right? So all of that is uh, good actions that are, are you know, baby steps to, to quote a movie, you know, that are um, is how you come to get your actions. And then finally, another personal thing you share that you're, you finally have a boyfriend, which is an important thing to have and do in college. And you're learning to share your feelings and and not be afraid to share your feelings, and that's good. Uh, and you almost skipped the fourth step, but you didn't. Your summary, your conclusion, and tie back to Oscar Wilde were fine. You wanted to stay within the time limit, and you did not. You wanted to move more naturally and use gestures and to convey your emotions honestly to the audience. How'd it go? Well, time limit, last time I went, like, Two minutes over, but this time it was a few seconds, so I guess it's better. It's getting better, yeah. But I realized that for my last speech and my introduction was really long, so this time instead of like, doing the rhetorical question that I normally do, I did the quote. Yes. I thought that would cut time a little bit, but I actually don't know how to be in time, and I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know either because uh, I, I was mesmerized by your stories and so uh, you, you had a lot of details in your stories which is where you could have yeah. cut. You could have probably cut your transition a little bit too. Uh, your, your, uh, some of your actions, about, you cut some of your acapella stuff too. I thought your third thing about conveying your emotions honestly to your audience, you did that well. So you did a good job. Thank you. Okay, that'll bring us to Geo. Ooh, ooh, Geo, do you have your computer here with you? Unfortunately, no. Oh. Hmm. 
How's our time? Okay, I'm gonna have. I, we're. I'm out of battery, so I'm gonna have to put a new battery in. So, hmm. Wait, who's after Geo? Who's after you? Is Charlie here? Uh, he went already. He already went. Okay, so you're the last one. Hmm. Should we go for it? Or? You want to try to go for it? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, whatever doesn't get recorded, I'll just base off of. Yo, live with it. Yeah. Let's see, we should. Yeah, let's try. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, rolling. Hi, everyone. I'm Gio. Hi, Gio. Hi, Gio. Hi guys. Yeah. So, uh, since we're all in college, I'm assuming we're old enough to have been in some sort of relationship, whether it was a long term one or one you had on Thursday night. And uh, <laughs> being the youngest of four siblings, um, you know, I always had a lot of guidance when it came to, you know, relationships and dating. You know, my two older sisters and my mom would always tell me, like, you know, don't have sex until you're 40, don't get married. <laughs> and, um, you know, my mom, she once told me, um, when she was giving me the talk, she said, you know, the best kind of relationships are those that are unexpected. Don't go out there looking for love, you know, just wait for it. It'll come when it's supposed to, you know, when you least expect it. And, um, you know, today, without getting too much gushy on you guys, I want to talk to you about personal commitment to my girlfriend, Kimmy. And I'm giving you two reasons and three actions <laughs> um, why I'm personally committed to her. And I think this is a very significant topic. One, because it's very personal um, to me, so it's definitely going to focus on that. And two, like I said, I'm sure some of you have been in some sort of relationship, so hopefully it'll help maybe inspire you for your one that you're currently in or maybe some future ones. Um, so the first reason why I'm personally committed to my girlfriend is because of when we met. Uh, when we met, uh, I met her through a mutual friend, let's call her Julie, and Julie was like, hey Gio, I need you to come to my work. They work at the coffee bean at LL. I don't know if you been there. She said, I need you to give advice to my coworker. I was like, okay. Yeah, I never had you know, a relationship before, but I'll give her a guy's perspective, but it's fine. Uh, so we go in, and the day that we walk in, the first thing I see is just this girl, and I'm just like, who is this? You know, I'm like, God, like, wow. You know, like, I want to meet her. Um, you know, but I don't have experience, so I was nervous. And next thing I know, Julie's walking up to the girl saying, Hey, Kimmy, uh, this is my friend Gio who's going to help you out. So in my mind, I'm like, crap, that's it, I'm done. Like, I friends on myself. But it ended, it ended up being the opposite. I mean, we had this amazing and just super stimulating conversation, you know. So by the end of the day, I was just so, uh, I was so in awe. I was so, it was so surreal because I didn't know this person. Yet I had this most amazing opportunity, and it was, I could tell it was special. Uh, the second reason why I'm personally committed to her is because we traveled the world together last summer when we studied abroad. And, uh, you know, if you went with your friends, you know, that's dope, it's your homie. I mean, if you went uh, in a program, you know, that's cool, you meet new people. Um, you know, but for a couple, especially ones that's so young, that's definitely a big step in the relationship, you know, and it's definitely a big experience because you guys are basically sharing a chapter of your life together. Um, you know, and so it was an awesome experience, you know, and really, like, we kind of grew together as a couple. Um, yeah, so it was super cool. And, uh, yeah, guys, uh, so now for actions. Uh, the first action that I've taken to being personally committed is learning. Now, like I said, uh, I never had a relationship before, so it was really hard for me to love her the way she wanted to be loved and treat her like a woman, you know, kind of differentiate between a girlfriend and a friend kind of thing, you know. Um, yeah, and so it was definitely a big lifestyle change for me. And I had a, I made a lot of mistakes along these two years, but I've learned from all of them. You know, so obviously not only crucial because it's not a relationship. Um, you know, and it's really helped me grow as a person and kind of make me see things and change my perspective up. And you know, we really like grown together. Yeah. Um, second thing uh, was communication. Uh, so you know, when we first met, uh, two months in, uh, summer came, and she lives in she lives in Bakersfield. I live down here in West Covina, and so we didn't really see each other for three months. You know, and especially if we're just knowing each other, that's kind of a big gap. Um, you know, so my problem with communication was that I could text all the day, all day, but when it came to talk to her on the phone, it was maybe like 20 seconds, and then she'd hang up because I didn't know what to say. So it was really awkward, um, but I fixed that. And the other thing, you know, came with like arguments and things. You know, I didn't really know how to express my emotions, not because I was scared. I just never really had to. Um, so communication was definitely a big thing for me, and it made me um, it helped us get closer together because it helped us understand each other more and help us connect together. And the last thing, and I know it may sound silly, is uh, I advanced my cooking skills. <laughs> I say that, you know, it's because my girlfriend's Latina, so she knows how to cook a lot of Mexican dishes, and she loves to bake, but she doesn't know how to cook, like, simple, like, grilled chicken and veggies, or pasta, or whatever it may be. Um, and, you know, after knowing her for a little while, I could tell that she was that girl who really appreciated the little things in life. And, uh, yeah, so when we got back from that summer, 
I took the initiative and I was like, you know, I'm gonna make her some pasta. She wants a PB and J. I'm gonna make her that with the toast cut off. Uh, you know me? She loves macaroni and cheese with breadcrumbs. So I was like, I'm gonna make that. I never use breadcrumbs, but I'm gonna try. Um, yeah. And so you know, I like I bring her, you know, like smoothies. I bring her food if, she, if I knew she was gonna have a late day. You know me? And like I'd write her like cute little messages. You know me? Um, yeah. And so <laughs> in performing these actions, it felt really good because the love that I was giving. I could tell I was really making her happy. I mean, that's all I really wanted from that. You know, I want, like if she was happy, I would be happy. And um, you know, I could tell that the love was being reciprocated. And by each action that I performed, it was kind of like building a big ass, big Lego tower um, of our relationship. You know, so we we formed a really strong relationship with these two years. And uh, in, in summary, I've told you guys two reasons and three actions for one person committed to my girlfriend. And hopefully, after the speech, there should be no doubt this dream that one person committed to her. And, you know, uh, my relationship was completely unexpected. You know, I went in to get advice, came out with a girlfriend. And, it's in, and like my mom said, the best kind of relationships are unexpected. And, yeah, you know, I think my relationship is pretty awesome. So. Thank you. Personal and authentic out there, and I, I just I just loved it. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Nelly. Hi, Hi Nelly. I really loved your speech. You had me giggling the entire time, as with most of us girls, I think, in here. I hate being the ones to have to give improvements because I feel it was so good. But I think you may have moved too many times. Yeah, like yeah. you were trying to break it up, and I see what you were trying to do. So just try to like one. Yeah, more purposeful in your movement. Your gra I'll do this quickly because we're really on borrowed time. Your 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 mother quoting your mother is great for an intro, and you can never go wrong with that. And you you got your audience when you said, you know, I want to share with you my commitment to my girlfriend Kimmy, and you told us gave us a preview. Um, and uh, your reasons were real personal. You told us a story of meeting at the coffee bean and how you felt and your feelings and that sort of thing. So that was good. And then the second reason was traveling together. And, you know, you really get to know somebody when you travel with them. Uh, if, if you don't know this, you folks, you will discover this, and sometimes you discover you don't like the person after you travel with them, too, so it cuts both ways, you know, because you, you can't fake it when you're traveling together. You can fake a long-term relationship and be on your best behavior and so forth. Um, your actions of learning communication and advanced cooking skills were all consistent with your uh, PC and they were uh, endearing to the audience. I could hear them ooing and aahing and liking what you were saying. They were consistent and you felt good doing it. And so everyone was persuaded that you are PC to your girlfriend. Um, and your tie back was good. I don't, did you have your, the, the, is it on the front? Very, very back here. Clearly and slowly, better delivery, more purpose. How'd it go? Uh, I didn't move with purpose, so obviously, you know, I moved too much. Um, yeah. Except for the next one, but I think in terms of seeing more clearly and having more infect, uh, inflection, inflection, yeah, worked really well for me in the speech. So. Yeah, I think you did a good job, and it was you really, you know, opened up and shared a side of you that we haven't seen, which is what I was after, being authentic. So thank you. Time is five twelve. Five twelve. Very good. All right, our work is done for the day. Return with honor. Thanks for our uh, time. Timing. <laughs> uh, extra, yeah. That's a souvenir for you. Yes.
I'm still videotaping. Cool, cool. I like being on videotape, you know that. Um, you were, uh, you told me to approach you later in the quarter about uh, yeah. the spring, or no, uh, the, uh, the rhetorical research thing?